guys, it's chapter six today. So yesterday we um, read about some interesting parts and they're actually back into the Caribbean island area. And remember yesterday they were, um, he was asking, do the Caribbeans chop people up for their cook pots and eat them? So he's kind of afraid, but he's up for the adventure, I think. All right, so chapter six, the primary source says, whilst we remained at the island, we saw a whale chased by a griever and a swordfish. They fought for the space of two hours. We might see the thresh, thresher with his flail lay on the monstrous loaves, which was strange to behold. In the end, these two fishes brought the whale to her end, Master George Percy. All right, observations. So they're, he's watching all of the fish and things play because the water's so clear you can see it. Okay, so these islands are strung together much like beads on a necklace. We set sail past one in half a day. We caught sight of another. I sneak up on deck so often my back is sore from being smacked with that, with that oar. But the sky and the water are so blue and everything is so new, I keep coming up anyway. It's hot. We boys and common men abandoned our shoes, stockings, doublets, and slops weeks ago. Now even the gentlemen go around with their white knobby knees peeking out from under their long shirt tails. We anchor near the island of Guadalupe and Captain Newport takes several men ashore to explore. While the boats are anchored, anchored we passengers are allowed up on deck. And so I stand at the railing watching the long boats glide through the water clear as turquoise glass. A strong hand closes on my arm, and I'm startled. It's Captain Smith. Look, he says, pointing. A huge black form corns, <coughs> comes racing through the sea. Close behind it are two smaller forms. It's a type of whale, the biggest fish in the sea, Captain Smith says. Then he smiles strangely. It's being chased. The three fish disappear behind the discovery, then reappear on the other side. What would chase a whale, I ask? Looks like a swordfish and a thresher shark, says Captain Smith. We shall see who wins. The whale surfaces and spurts out a spray of air and water. In that moment, the thresher rears its tail and lands a tremendous blow <coughs> excuse me, on the whale's snout. The whale is stunned. He tries to escape, but the swordfish swims in to cut him. Bright red blood swirls in the clear water. The thresher lands another harsh blow in another. The whale becomes confused, swims in circles. The swordfish darts in and out, cutting and slicing. Soon, the once blue water is murky with blood, and as the whale slows, the thresher deals more slammingly, bl slamming blows, and the swordfish cuts again and again. Finally, the whale rises to the surface, spurts a stream of spray one more time, then rolls over belly skyward, so belly up. Captain Smith has a satisfied look on his face as if his regiment has just won a battle. You see how it is when you've left the confines of England, he asked me. You might have been born the biggest fish in the sea, but the skill and preservation of those lower born can take you down and destroy you. Somehow I knew he was talking about Master Wingfield, the biggest fish in the sea. I glanced around to see who else had heard. I see Master Clavel glaring at us, and I wondered how long Captain Smith will remain unshackled if he keeps talking this way about the gentleman. Land ho! I hear a familiar shout. It must be another island, but then I hear more. Is this where we'll drop anchor, Captain, and take all the men on shore? Yes, have the bosom ready the long boat. I run up on the deck. They'll soon be busy now to catch, to catch me. The day is rare overcast one, and the sails reflect the gray of the sky. <clears throat> the Susan Constance turns, sailors rush to pull on lines, and we are on our way, gliding into shore. As we get closer, I see the tall trees. They've got huge green leaves at their tops, and their bare trunks curve upward, like fingers reaching for the sky. I see a bright green and yellow bird fly from one treetop to another. Land. I wonder if I'll remember how to walk on it. Fetch the tents. Lower the longboats. Men gathering your belongings. We are going on shore. I gladly, very gladly, help load bedding, tents, pots, and pans onto the long boat and to be taken ashore. The Godspeed and the Discovery anchor nearby as well and their men unload. 
this will be the first time since we left England that all of us, all 105 of us, men and boys who are passengers and three crews of sailors will be together in one place. They are probably Carib Indians on the island, Captain Newport tells us, but we will give them beads and our soldiers will stand guard at night and we'll be safe. I'm one of the last to go ashore. When I finally stand on the white sand, it feels like it's, it's moving underneath me. I laugh out loud. More than three months on a ship has confused my legs so much that solid land feels like the rocking deck. Samuel, look, we're, we're Carib Indians, James calls to me. He and Richard have taken off their shirts and they're running naked through the water, splashing, splashing each other. I have been waiting for James or Richard or both to tell me how I was wrong and they were right about the Caribs, but neither of them has. I have been on my guard, ready to rough them up if they say one word about it. Are they taunting me now, showing me what naked Caribs look like, telling me I was wrong not to believe them? Come on, Samuel. James stands in waist deep water, dripping wet. His skin is peaked pale and his fair hair is plastered against his head. It's salty, he says, and he licks some water from his hands. It's fun. Come swim with us. I blink at him. No taunting, no insisting they were right and I was wrong. No hating me for how badly I have treated him and Richard this whole journey. I wonder if James can really be this forgiving or if he's simply so happy to be off that stinking ship that he has forgotten the past. Come on in, you prig, calls uh, pr Richard. You need a good delousing. Ooh, that means they might have lice. Ooh. That makes me mad. You're the one who brought the lice on the ship, I shout. I yank off my shirt and charge into the water. I splash Richard in the face until he begs for breath. And when I stop, he's gasping. He smiles a little as if he wants to pretend it was fun, but I know it was not. My eyes dare him to try and splash me back or insult me again. I know he will not. He doesn't want to lose another tooth. Stop, you two, Jane whines. Look at the fish. He tries his best to distract Richard and me from our quarrel. I feel tickling on my legs, and when I look down into the clear water, I see small blue and yellow fish nibbling on me. The water's warm, so much warmer than the times, like the, the river back in England. I want to live here forever, says James. I'd never go back to my stepmom ever. She would think I'd died and that would make her happy. I want to stay here too, says Richard. I wouldn't be cold ever again. Well, me either, because that's like down in the Bahamas. Ooh, I'd love to go there right now. I shake my head. I still want to go to Virginia, I say. There's a sack of gold waiting for me there. Maybe 10 sacks. Reverend Hunt calls to us from shore. Boys, come here, put your shirts on. The sun will burn your skin. I wish we didn't have to leave the water, but we do what Reverend Hunt says. Disobeying him would be like disobeying God. When we get to the shore, he is holding our shirts in three wide-brimmed straw hats. The sun here is like 10 English suns, he says. You put these on. Remember, that's because it's close to the equator. Remember, that's where the sun is the strongest. And that's where it's the hottest. Reverend Hunt waits while we put our shirts over our heads and tie the hat strings under our chin. Now, he said, there is work to be done. There are the tents to be set up. The cook wants all the pots scrubbed with sand and Captain Ratcliffe wants a path cut to the bath. They found hot baths in the forest. So like these hot springs. And he says the gentleman can't be tromping through the underbrush to get to them. Captain Ratcliffe of the, be of the beady eyes and pointy nose, Captain Smith grumbles that he doesn't see why the gentleman can't walk through the forest like everyone else. But Captain Ratcliffe has the power to give orders, not Captain Smith. When we join the others, I see the older boy, Nathaniel. He's holding a hatchet. He must be on his way to help clear the path. I don't want to scrub pots like a woman, so I hurry to get one of the hatchets too, and I swing it a few times to feel its weight and power. I want to do a man's job. Henry, Abram, and Nathaniel and several of the sailors start toward the forest with their hatchets, and I follow them. What do we have here? Henry turns to look at me and then stops to block my way. A scrawny chicken coming to work with the men? I don't answer. I wanna say I wouldn't be so scrawny if he'd leave me more of the food uh, to eat. I try to skirt around him and continue on my way, but he puts out one powerful arm to stop me. 
Go back and scrub pots with the other boys, he growls. You'll only get in the way. He yanks the hatchet out of my hand and cuffs me. I glare at him silently as he turns and walks after the others. What is he going to do with the two hatchets? I hope he chops himself in the leg. Reluctantly, I go find the cook. He's already hovering over Richard and James, showing them how to scoop up a handful of sand with a rag and use it to scrub out the mess pots. They haven't had a really good cleaning in three months, so the sand has some hard work to do. I join them, toiling under the hot sun until sweat drips from my face. I wish I could go back playing in the salty sea or swinging a hatchet in the shade of the forest. Suddenly a scream comes from the forest, a man's scream of pain. Soon there's another cry and then such shouting and shrieking it turns my blood cold. I remember Captain Smith's answer when I ask if the caribs chop people up for their cook pot, only if they catch them. The path cutters, I shout, it's coming from the, that direction. Gentlemen and soldiers grab their weapons and hurry toward the terrible sound. James and Richard huddled together behind the largest cook pot. I spot a sword and a belt, and belt someone has left lying in the sand. Quickly, I try to fasten the belt around me. It's too big. I pull the sword out of its sheath, and with the bare sword, I run toward the sound of the battle. Down the nearly cut path, I go, high sweep, stepping <coughs> over stumps and roots, following the soldiers and gentlemen. We all converge on the path's cutters. They're yelling and writhing as if the fighting invisible, they're fighting invisible demons. Henry is <clears throat> hopping, swatting his arms and neck, shouting in agony. There is not a care of Indian in sight. What is this? Reverend Hunt demands, his voice booming over the cries. What is happening here? Fire! Henry cries. It feels like fire! And I jerk my head around, searching the jungle. Have the caribs attacked and run off, or is it some strange beast? I hold out my sword, ready to fight, but I see nothing. The hatchets are all on the ground, and Reverend Hunt reaches to pick one up. No, Reverend, don't touch it. It's Captain Smith's voice. Angry red welts are rising on Henry's arms and neck, and Abram and the others, too. To the baths, Captain Smith orders them. That will give you some relief and they take off running, swatting at themselves as they go. It's the <clears throat> machine old tree, Captain Smith says, when things have quieted, quit quieted, I can't talk today, down. The caribs use its sap to poison their arrows and burns like fire. Our men must have chopped into it. I'm impressed with Captain Smith's knowledge. As a soldier, he has already traveled the world and has learned so much. Chopping up the newly cut path at that moment is Captain Ratcliffe. His face is dripping with sweat. This all happen, happened, Captain Smith says loudly, thanks to Captain Ratcliffe and his ridiculous idea of the gentleman's path. So that wouldn't have happened if they just kind of walked through the forest. Captain Ratcliffe wipes his brow and scowls. It looks to me as if he would spit in Captain Smith's face if he weren't so overheated. The two men stare at each other, fuming. Let's go, everyone. Back to, your, back to your work, Reverend Hunt says. With a wave of his hand, he gets the men moving. It somehow breaks the standoff between Captain Smith and Captain Ratcliffe. Captain Ratcliffe calls after the men. I want a new crew to cut the path. Just leave those blasted machine whatever trees alone. Captain Smith shakes his head and mumbles angrily under his breath. I walk back toward the stack of mess pots waiting to be scrubbed. I carry the sword I borrowed, and Captain Smith comes up behind me. That needs cleaning, he says, and it startles me. I give him a sideways look, and then I understand he means the sword. The metal is tarnished and even rusting in some places. I will show you how to clean it, and when you return it, the owner will thank you, he says. On the beach, Captain Smith demonstrates to me how to clean the sword with a rag and sand. He says this sand is fine enough to do the job. It is surprisingly similar to cleaning and polishing mess pots. He orders me to do as he has shown me. I reach for the rag, then I stop. What if I do it wrong? Will he beat me, make a fool of me? I lower my hand. Is it better to remain unteachable? If you will not obey me, Captain Smith says in a low, cold voice, there are other crueler men you may serve instead. I clench my teeth, nothing to do but try. I reached slowly for the rag again, scooped up sand, pressed it against the sword blade, and gave it a stroke. I forget to be careful, and my finger slides along the blade, and I yelp, 
stick out my sliced finger into my mouth and suck on the blood. Captain Smith laughs. Aw, oh, I cut my fingers many times learning to clean a sword. Let me see it, he says, and I hold out my finger. It is still bleeding, but the cut is not so deep that it won't stop me from using my hand. Captain Smith rips a strip off the rag and ties it tightly around my finger. Try again, he orders. I look up at him. I did it wrong, and yet he didn't beat me. So remember back then, they used to whip people a lot for things. I picked up the rag again. I'm careful of my fingers this time. I give a short stroke and another and another, and soon the rust and the tarnish spots have turned to shine. They gleam in the late afternoon sun. Captain Smith nods. Good, he says. Now return it to its owner before one of these lazy gentlemen calls you a thief. I run off to find the belt and the sheet. They are still lying in the sand, and I return the sword to its place. That evening, I hear hammering, and after a while, I go to see what it's being built. Have some of the gentlemen decided they need houses instead of tents to sleep in? When I see what it is, my mouth goes dry. A wooden frame, a rope hanging from the highest beam, a noose tied to the rope. Master Wingfield has not forgotten his promise to hang Captain Smith. So, they're building the hanging beam where they would hang somebody from, so... Do you think it'll be Captain Smith? We will find out. Have a great day.